I'm glad I wasn't leading music because I had no clue. <laughs> I've never heard that last song before. <laughs> we try to wear out our hymn book, but I guess we haven't plumbed those depths yet. Who? I just wonder who else knew that song besides the Howards. Oh, okay. What do I know? <laughs> well, <clears throat> Brother Brad was just telling me that I shouldn't preach long tonight. I got to tell us. <laughs> well, I got to tell a story because we were at a church in Texas one time, and of course they gave me the pulpit twenty minutes till, so I started preaching, and it right at noon. They had a pie dinner, so they decided that was more important than preaching. So the lady came up and started playing the invitation while I'm preaching. So I said, okay, I guess I'm done. (laughs) The very same service, we had a real quick invitation. Somebody came to the Lord. So God overrode that. and So so brother, it doesn't matter what you do. God's going to do what he's going to (laughs) do. I had the privilege of leading somebody to the Lord, that same message. Well, this is, uh, I don't, don't really have a title for this message, but I guess if I were to categorize this message, it would be, uh, how do we respond in a godly manner when people do us wrong? You know, I, I guess that's really what it boils down to. Uh, there's certain, certain truths about godly living. Am I, am I okay here with this? Okay. I just saw some, you know, there are certain truths about living as a Christian, and maybe I'm alone, I suspect I'm not, but maybe you can identify with this. You don't even have to be a Christian, but this is certainly true of the Christian walk. First of all, when we try to do well, people are going to mistreat us. Am I by myself on this? You try to live the way God wants you to live, and people are still going to abuse you. They're going to take advantage of you. It's just people. And it doesn't always have to be from somebody on the outside. Many times it comes from the inside, inside these four walls. People mistreat you. You know, we can't choose how people treat us. Maybe you've heard your mother say this. You can't choose how people are going to act, but you can choose how you respond. You know, the same is true of the Christian I can't help it when somebody mistreats me, but I can certainly choose how to respond back. Do I get revenge? Do, do I you know, get even with them? Or do I do something different? That's going to be part of the message tonight. How do I respond when people mistreat me? Um, and here's a third truth. You know, God can use a bad situation and turn it around for good in your life. When you find yourself on the receiving end of somebody mistreating you, abusing you, you know, God can still use that situation. In fact, dare I say that God might actually be allowing that in your life to teach you something? Well, look in 2 Samuel verse or 2 Samuel chapter 16. You can probably guess where I'm going here. This is to a man named David. And this is an incident where David was mistreated unfairly by somebody. <clears throat> now, a little bit of a background, a little bit of background information. Um, recall how David rose to power. Saul was king. Of course, he wasn't the king that God would have had for his people, but the people demanded a king, and this is who they wanted. So God said, okay, I'm going to give you who you're asking for. They gave him this man named Saul. Well, Saul started out okay, but as he, as he began to, as his, as his reign continued not very, not very long, he started to uh, really disobey God. And, and the more he disobeyed God, the more God said, you know what, you're not the king. God, in fact, told Saul on one occasion... He said, I'm done with you. Now, this is my paraphrase here. This isn't King James. He said, I'm done with you. What I've done is I've gone and I've found me a man after my own heart. I've found me a king who's really going to be the king that I want for this people. It was David. 
David was a, was a little shepherd boy. And God had the prophet Samuel, and I'm not going to go into the details, you probably know all this, how that he was anointed king above his brothers. Well, the problem was with David, when he was anointed king, Saul was still king. David couldn't just step right in and take over because there was a little problem. There was still a reigning king on the throne. In fact, Saul, when he found out that David was to become king, he became so jealous that he began to chase David out of Jerusalem. And he began to chase him around and around, and uh, David would not kill Saul. Well, eventually Saul died, and David did ascend to the throne, and he began to reign. His reign, you know, according to the Bible, was the, the greatest reign that Israel ever had because anytime you read about the kings in Israel after David had died, they always compare that king to David. This king was, he honored God the way David did, or he had a heart after God the way David did. So David's reign was considered by the Bible to be a great reign. But there was a problem with David's reign. He started to grow complacent. You know, that's a problem that we can also have in our Christian walk is God has redeemed us. He has placed us in a, in a position where we're no longer servants to sin. But you know, we can still grow complacent. We can, time to time, we can grow lazy in our faith and we can find ourselves doing things that Christians ought not to be doing. What did David do? Well, when he should have been out in, in the field with his army fighting, he stayed behind. And he looked out, over, out of his palace window on one occasion and saw a woman taking a bath, doubtless with no clothes on, and he became uh, lust, he, lust in his heart. He lusted after her. Her name was Bathsheba. Well, when David found out that she was the wife of one of his his uh, military men, uh, he had a problem because he had an affair with her and made her pregnant. And he found out, well, she's the wife of one of his faithful fighting men. So David tried to have this man, her husband, come back from the field, and he tried to have him sleep with his wife so that it would appear as though he got her pregnant, but he wouldn't do it. So David now was in a quandary because he had done what he shouldn't have done. He got this girl pregnant, and by the rule of the law, he should have died for this. And he had her husband killed on the, on the fighting field. So now David not only had an affair, but he also murdered her husband. And he tried to hide that secret, but he didn't hide it very long because Nathan the prophet came to him, and he likened him to a story about a person, a man who had a, a sheep. And he said, you know, this man had one sheep, but along comes another person, a wealthy man, who had lots of sheep, and he stole that one sheep from that person, from that man, and he slaughtered and killed that little sheep that was that man's pet. And, and David was enraged and said that, that, that he should uh, you know, be punished for that. And Nathan the prophet said, you're the man. You've done this. That, that, that story was about you, David. You, you took what belonged to somebody else even though you were blessed beyond measure. Bless you. That was that, perfect because I just said the word blessed. And the prophet Nathan said, because you've done this, the sword's not going to depart from your house. And not too long after, David's son, his son's name was Absalom, tried to usurp the throne. And David, and this was a direct result of God's judgment on David for what he did for the adulterous relationship and the murder of her husband. He is now finding himself fleeing Jerusalem because his son has attempted to usurp the throne and his son Absalom probably would have killed his own father if he hadn't fled Jerusalem. So what did David do? David took 600 of his men and doubtless their wives and family and he left Jerusalem weeping because he is no longer on the throne and this is part of that judgment well we're getting into the account that i want to get into because david and his men were walking along and look with me in six chapter 16 verse number five i'm just going to read down through verse number eight i'm going to take this bit by bit 
And when, the, and when King David came to Bahurim, now that's very near Jerusalem, uh, when he came to Bahurim, behold, thence came out a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei. The son of Gera, he came forth and cursed still as he came. Now, this Shimei was of the same family as Saul, who was the king who had died. So there's a little bit of bias here with Shimei. And he cast stones at David and at all the servants of the king David and said, I'm sorry, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. And thus said Shimei when he cursed, Come out, come out, thou bloody man, and thou man of Belial. The Lord hath returned upon thee all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose stead thou hast reigned. And the Lord hath delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom thy son. And behold, thou art taken in thy mischief, because thou art a bloody man. Let me stop there. <clears throat> David probably did not deserve at least for the reason he was being accused of, of this man hurling stones at David and at his men. You know, that, that's so true of you and I tonight because I believe that David here is exemplifying uh, what you and I can go through in our Christian walk. People are going to hurl stones at us at times, sometimes maliciously, sometimes they don't always intend it to, but they do hurl stones and more often than not, it's not deserved. Has anybody ever been in a situation where somebody has said something to you or done something and you know you didn't deserve it? I've been there. My wife has been there. And oftentimes, it comes because we don't deserve it. Sometimes it comes in the form of false accusations. You notice Shimei, what he said here? He called him a bloody man. And he said it was because that he's a bloody man that, that he's no longer in the position that he was in. See, Shimei taunted David with the observation that since he was a man of war or man of blood, God was now avenging the death of Saul and his family by driving David from power. Remember, David is being driven from power, and this is God's providence, because of his personal sin not because of the fact that he was a man of war. And yet Shimei is accusing him falsely of why he is in a position that he's in. David had not given Shimei any reason to accuse him. Did you know that David prayed for Saul when Saul persecuted him? When David could have killed Saul, at least on three occasions, he, he had Saul delivered into his hands and David could have killed him. But yet, the Bible says that David prayed for him instead. Certainly he spared his life. David writes this in Psalm 35, They have rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned unto my own, into my own bosom. I behaved myself as though he had been my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one that mourneth for his mother. But in my adversity they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. Yea, the, the abjects gathered themselves together against me, and I knew it not. They did not tear me, in, I'm sorry, they did tear me and cease not. With hypocritical mockers and feasts they gnashed upon me with their teeth. David here is testifying of the fact that when he did good to somebody, they returned it as evil back to him. And on several occasions, David had spared the life of Saul. And yet still, at least on two of those occasions, Saul still sought his life. David had respect furthermore unto God's anointed king. Do you ever wonder why David didn't kill Saul when he could have? I mean, after all, David knew that God had rejected Saul as king. David knew that he was anointed and that he was supposed to be the next king. Why didn't David kill him? I mean, wouldn't he be helping God's plan along by, by doing that? No, because he had respect unto God's anointed. David, in his mind, knew this. 
He knew that when God's timing was right, God would take care of Saul. David would not be that instrument because he had respect not as much to Saul, but as he did to God and God's anointed and God's plan. You know, this is an aside here, but, but rather than complaining about the government and about the American government, why don't we just understand this, that, that God has people in place, God has placed our prime minister here right in position that he wants them. God has put the premiers in place. He's put authority in place. And it's God's doing, not man's doing. So rather than complaining, why don't we have respect unto God's anointed? And let's accept God's plan. Now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do everything that we can to affect our government and our society for what we believe. But uh, you know, we need to understand that they're there because God put them there. All that to say this, David didn't give Shimei any reason to accuse him. David was simply following God's plan for his life. As far as Shimei was concerned, David was in the position he was in because of the fact that he was uh, usurping Saul as a rightful king. No, that was God's doing. But we need to understand that it's important that we don't give others any reason to accuse us. Now that doesn't mean I'm perfect, and I'm certainly uh, can say that there's nobody in here who's perfect because I know I'm not. And there's certainly things in my life that I know that are wrong, but to the best of my ability, to the best of our ability, we need to live a life that is exemplary, that doesn't give people reason to accuse us so that when they do accuse us, there's no basis for it. Uh, Philippians 2.15 says that ye be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world. Uh, Blameless and harmless. Blameless doesn't mean perfect. Blameless simply means that that we don't give somebody ammunition to accuse us of wrongdoing. People are going to do us wrong when it's undeserved, and it it often comes from those whom whom, whom we trust the most. Sometimes it can come from family. Sometimes it can come from close friends. In fact, I dare say more often than not, when we're uh, wronged by somebody, it's usually somebody who's close to us. Somebody we thought we trusted. David writes this in Psalm 41, verse 9, Yea, my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. Now, we know that David was prophetically writing about the Lord Jesus, but uh, when he wrote that, he may not have realized that. Uh, He was writing of his own life experience. Those that were closest to him are the ones that were causing him the most trouble, that were wronging him. Oftentimes, it happens when we're the most vulnerable, when we're wronged by others, when people cast stones at us. It's usually when we're in a vulnerable position. You know, when David was fleeing Jerusalem, he was an easy target. I mean, Shimei never would have done that if David was in Jerusalem. When David was on the throne and he, had, he was surrounded by his military and he had all of the, the wealth that decides, he never would have dared have done that. But now he sees David in a vulnerable position. He's up on a hilltop and David and his men are down here and he's casting stones. I don't know. Maybe he thought he could outrun them. Maybe he had a cave hiding somewhere. But it, that's what happens to you and I. It's when we're vulnerable, when we're an easy target, and oftentimes when we're defenseless that people begin to misuse and, and treat us wrongly. It's funny how that works. I don't know if people do it on purpose, but oftentimes it's when we're in a position where we're vulnerable when that happens. You know it could happen when when God is leading us through a particularly difficult season of our lives and all we're trying to do is maintain and we don't have the energy to respond to people when they begin to do that to us? I think the devil knows. I really do. I think the devil knows when we're in a vulnerable position, when we have little energy and he motivates people to attack us. You know... I wasn't really sure if I was going to share this, but I really, just to drive the point home, we, we knew a missionary family 
they were supposed to go to New Zealand. And for one reason or another, they, they didn't go to the mission field, but they stayed behind. And one of the reasons was they had a very sick child who had a condition. Uh, well, they had another child. I, I'm not sure if I get the details straight, but one of their children died from this medical condition that was inherited somehow, and the child died. Well, another missionary that I was talking to, who we both knew this other couple, told me this. He said, God killed their child because they didn't go to the mission field and they're out of the will of God. And I thought, that is, <laughs> I don't have words for that. Who, who are we to judge somebody else when, when they're in a vulnerable position? And that just goes to show that it doesn't take an unbeliever to attack another Christian. Oftentimes it comes from those that, are, that, that we should be trusting the most. And they attack us when we're in a vulnerable position we have no way to defend ourselves. They want to remind us of our failures. You know, Revelation says that we have an enemy up there right now. He's in heaven. He's at the throne of God accusing us every day. Every time we fail, he's up there reminding God of our failures. And sometimes he uses people to remind us that, that we fail. And, and I fail, you fail. But we don't have to, we don't have to, you know, be downtrodden because of our failures. We don't have to be destroyed because of our failures. But yet, that's what people try to do to us. Well, what is our response going to be when people treat us this way? Look in uh, verse number nine. Then said Abishai, the son of Zeruah, unto the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. Now, honestly, if I were in David's position, I might be tempted to agree with that. But notice David's response. And the king said, What have I to do with you, ye sons of Zeruah? Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord hath said unto him, Curse David. Who shall then say, Wherefore hast thou done so? And David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, which came forth of my bowels, seeketh my life. How much more may this Benjaminite do it? Let him alone, let him curse, for the Lord hath bidden him. It may be that the Lord will look on mine afflictions, and that the Lord will requite me good for his cursing this day. You know, that's what David did. Rather than his response, rather than looking horizontal, it was vertical. Rather than focusing, on, focusing in on this person, he, he looked to God. What is our response going to be when people misuse us and mistreat us? Well, certainly we can get even. Uh, just because we're Christians doesn't mean that time to time we don't want to get even with people. It's crossed my heart many times. You know, David could easily have destroyed this turkey. He, he could have sent his men up there. The guy, all he had armed, all he was armed with was sticks and stones. David's men had, uh, you know, the weaponry that they had, swords, shields. They could have taken them out. But David didn't do that. You know what? Should, should we get even with people when they misuse us? Well, just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I have to be a doormat, right? Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I have to be somebody's punching bag. Well, let me remind you what Jesus said. In Matthew 5, verse 44 to 45, He said, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you, and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. You know what Jesus said? Did he say reward evil for evil? Kill your enemies? Curse those that curse you? No. He said do good to them. <laughs> well, I don't know, but that kind of sounds like a doormat to me. It kind of sounds to me like as a Christian, when people abuse me, I'm supposed to turn the other cheek be be because God still loves that person. And if I get even with somebody... There goes my testimony out the window. And as far as I know, 
that might end their chance of ever coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are we to be a doormat? I think so. Are we to get even in revenge? No, we're to let the Lord do that. And I think David caught on to that. Remember this, God didn't get even with us. And I'm so thankful God didn't get even with me. You know what we need? We need a heavenly perspective on this. When when somebody mistreats us, let's remember this, we've mistreated God, and yet God didn't destroy us. Jesus said uh, when He was in the garden, when uh, the... You know, I believe it was Peter cut off the servant's ear. And, 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 and the Lord Jesus said, Thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my Father, and He shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? Look, God, God can wipe us out just like that. There's nobody in here who does not be, deserve to be wiped out by God because we have offended Him so grievously by our sin, and yet God loved us enough that He didn't destroy us. How much less when somebody mistreats us compared to what we've done to God is that? And if God loved us enough to not destroy us, should we not do everything in our power to not ruin it for somebody else? Yes, they've mistreated us, but God still loves that person. Oh, but you don't know what they've done to me. (laughs) You know, there's always that person that says that. I, I hear what you're saying, but... You don't know what they've done to me. You're right, I don't. But it does not compare to what we've done to God. Nothing that somebody does to me or you can compare to how you've offended a holy God. And yet God still loved you enough to not destroy you, but to save your soul. It's never justified getting even, though we try to justify it. It's never justified. Uh, Paul writes this in Romans if you're writing verses, it's Romans 12, verse 19 to 21. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So, Getting even? No. We're to do the exact opposite of what human nature is and we're to repay them good for evil. Somebody mistreats me? I pray for them. I might even ask, I should ask them, can I pray for you? Is there something going on in your life? I don't know what's going on here, but is there something that I can help you with? You know, that goes against human nature. But that is what we're called to do. And David exemplified that very attitude Well, let me give you another possible response. Getting even, we can also get angry. Well, we can can hold it all in and not get even, but we can be eaten up inside with anger at somebody. And let me tell you this, when we're angry with somebody, it will eventually come out. Eventually, that anger will manifest itself in some way that is either going to tear you up or tear somebody else alive. Let me ask you this. And th- this is just a rhetorical question because I know the answer. How is your prayer life when you're filled with anger? Can you honestly pray to God when you're filled with anger in your heart? You can't do it. Oh, you might think you can. I know, I know the psalmist said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, he won't hear me. But when we allow ourselves to be filled with anger because of what somebody's done to us, the only person we're hurting is ourselves and our intimacy with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But here's a third response. We can submit to God. And that is what David exemplified here. Rather than getting even with Shimei for his outburst and throwing rocks, he looked to God and said, this is God's will. He discerned that this was God speaking to him or working in his life. And so should it be with you and I. Whenever we're in a situation like that with somebody, we need to submit to the Lord. You know, we're going to submit to something in our life. 
We're either going to submit to God or we're going to submit to ourselves, to our own personal ego. Why not, submit to, why not submit to God? God could possibly be teaching us something through these difficult situations. Well, what could God possibly be teaching me by letting somebody run over me like a steamroller? Well, number one, I'm certain that He is trying to teach us humility. Uh, you, you know, because you know what humility is? It is putting myself aside and putting God on the pedestal where He belongs. Vengeance belongs to God, not to me. Pride on the other side of the spectrum from humility lashes out at people. It says, you won't do that to me. I'm number one. Nobody does that to me. I've got to, I've got to vindicate myself. You see the difference between humility and pride? God is trying to help us become humble. Perhaps God might be teaching us forgiveness. You know, forgiveness doesn't come easy. And I can tell you this right now, it's difficult. It's a difficult thing to learn. And oftentimes we don't learn forgiveness until we've gone through the fire. We, we can say we forgive somebody, but then we continue to burn inside. We've never really forgiven. But when we submit to God and God begins to work, we're able to forgive. Maybe God's teaching us patience. I believe that all three of these are true. Whenever we're wronged by somebody, we look rather to God than to vengeance or some other way of manifesting our anger at somebody. God is helping us to be patient. And once again, God is patient with us. God continues to be patient with me because I still mess up. And I think Pastor Bramblett said this, you know, the definition of long-suffering is, is uh, being patient in the face of suffering when somebody does you wrong. That's what God is. He's long-suffering. Uh, James says this, James 1.4, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You know God wants us to be patient. Long-suffering is a form of patience because uh, when we're being pelted the way David was, to be patient, according to the Bible, means to be perfected. And God wants to do that. What will God's response be to us when we respond in a godly manner? Look in verse 13. And as David and his men went by the way, Shimei went along the hillside over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust. Well, this guy was a little scallion, wasn't he? But look at the response here in verse 14. And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. Isn't it interesting that in the face of all of this, David and his men were able to just stop and refresh themselves? How could he do that? How can somebody, when they're being pelted the way he was, when we're being attacked by people, can we refresh ourselves? Well, David knew this, that God would re reward his long-suffering. And, and the same is true for us. When we respond in a godly manner, God's going to reward us for it. God doesn't let that kind of thing go unseen. You know, God exalted the house of David over the house of Saul. It didn't happen right away. David had to wait for that. It was years before God removed Saul from the throne and put David, even though he was anointed, placed him on that throne. God rewarded David's patience. God allowed David to be the ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that David never lived to see Jesus? David knew that one day this king would come from his lineage, but he never lived to see it. We may never see God's full reward in this lifetime. When we respond to people in a manner that's contrary to ourselves and our egos and our flesh, oftentimes we may not see the reward right away. It may not happen in our lifetime, but notice this in 1 Peter 3.6. I'm sorry, 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. 
You know what due time is? It's God's time. It's not, not my time. It's not somebody else's time. It's His time. And that may not happen on this earth. But one day God will exalt us in due time. He will reward our patience. He will reward our long-suffering. He'll give, a, he'll give us peace of mind. Notice in verse 14, And the king and all the people that were with him came weary and refreshed themselves there. God gave David a peace of mind. I don't know that I could have had that peace of mind without God, without that heavenly perspective that David had. I would be seething with anger. But yet David had a godly perspective on his, on his life. God's going to reward evildoers one day. Now, now let, me, let me just clarify this. I, I don't want my worst enemy to go to hell. I really don't. There are people that say things about me. There are people that spread rumors who mistreat me. I don't want them to go to hell because God loves them. And I was once as they were, and yet God still loved me. But one day God will reward those who reject Him. You know, God did deal with Shimei. If you want the full story, look at 2 Kings 2, verses 44 to 46. God did eventually deal with Shimei. But He removed that burden from David. David said, I don't want that burden. I want God to handle this. And because of that, David and his men were able to refresh themselves. Rather than focusing on vengeance, we should be focused on the presence of God, just the way David was. Um, it's when we do this that God takes a most difficult situation and turns it into a mountaintop experience. You, you, you know what difficult times are? It's an opportunity for God to take you from the valley and put you on a mountain. You want a real mountaintop experience? Turn to God in your difficult moments and God will lift you up. David learned this. You know Psalm 23. You could probably quote this. In verse 5, he said, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. And what does the rest of that say? And my cup runneth over. You know, it's very well David could have written that in the face of persecution, in the face of difficulties. We can do the same thing. You know, Joseph learned this. You know, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, left him for dead. And as far as his brothers were concerned, uh, Dave, or Joseph, uh, he could have died and they never would have known it. And they sold him into slavery. But Joseph decided, I'm going to use this situation to honor God in my life. And what did God do? God made him the second most powerful ruler in Egypt. And because of Joseph's submission to God, God saved his people Israel. Moses learned this. You know, Hebrews says that, that Moses uh, forsook the riches of Egypt because the, the Bible says to him they were like just the temporal pleasures of sin. And instead, Moses desired instead to, to be named among his own people. I know I'm not quoting Hebrews here. But, but Moses, rather than enjoying the pleasures of Egypt, decided he was going to be, uh, suffer the affliction of the people of God. And as a result, he was sent into exile because he was defending one of his fellow Hebrew men and had killed an Egyptian. Well, Moses could have become bitter and angry, but what did he do? He submitted to God. Forty years on the backside of the desert, submitting to God, and God spoke to him in a burning bush. And said, I'm going to use you to lead my people out of Egypt. Now, could God have done that had Moses not submitted to him first? Probably not. But God used the submission in the lives of these two men to do a great and mighty work. He can do the same for you and I. You know, when we learn to submit to God in the most difficult circumstances, especially when it comes to other people, we are actually exemplifying the character of Christ in our lives. Because Jesus Christ exemplified this very thing. Uh, he submitted to the will of God in the face of terrible, tremendous, oper or, uh, uh, per I'm going to get the word out in a minute, persecution and opposition. And when we do this, we also exemplify 
the life of Christ. And I believe, as the Bible says, when we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, He will exalt us in due time. So let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for this story. Lord, I pray that we might be able to just digest this and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know what else comes up.